This video was created in partnership with Bill Gates, inspired by his new book, How to Avoid a Climate Disaster. If you've ever gotten into your car on a hot day, you've experienced the greenhouse effect. Your windshield lets in sunlight and traps the associated energy in your car, and then you open the door and hop on in and immediately burn the backs of your legs on the seat. And this is similar to what happens on a global scale. The sun shines light onto Earth, and our atmosphere traps the energy associated with that light in the form of heat. Now, if our planet were exactly like cars, we'd have a pretty serious problem as anyone who has ever been stuck in a hot car might know. It would eventually become unbearably hot, too hot for any of us to survive. Fortunately, some of that energy is released back towards space and ends up exciting greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, keeping both the atmosphere and us on the ground at a comfortable temperature. Well, in theory. In practice, the world is currently emitting 51 billion tons of greenhouse gases into the atmosphere every year, and that number has only only gone up. We're essentially throwing the greenhouse effect into overdrive, exciting more molecules and further heating up the atmosphere, which causes global temperatures to rise overall. And while one or two degrees might not sound like that much, it's already had a variety of harmful effects, from wildfires and hurricanes of increasing severity and frequency, to rising sea levels that are beginning to affect coastal regions, to increasingly hot summers and cold winters. And if you think that sucks now, climate researchers predict that if we continue to see this trend of rising global temperatures, We'll see food crises due to decreasing crop yield and increasing incidences of severe, possibly fatal heat stroke due to rising temperatures. So how can we prevent this from happening? Stopping the global temperature increases will require us to bring our current carbon emissions down considerably from 51 billion tons to zero. And while I truly cannot understate how non-trivial of a task that is, after all, there is no silver bullet when it comes to dealing with our climate emergency, with a lot of work and innovation over the next several years, we can develop and deploy new technologies that can help us get that number down. In fact, machine learning has been posed as a potential tool to help us solve our climate crisis, from optimizing energy usage in commercial and residential buildings, to identifying and combating climate-related misinformation, to forecasting local agricultural impacts of global climate trends. However, recent research on the environmental impact of machine learning research has fueled concerns that machine learning itself may be a significant contributor to greenhouse gas emissions, considering the amount of electricity needed to train and test models day in and day out. So can machine learning really help us avoid a climate disaster? Well, as with most climate technologies, it can't do so alone and it will come with a cost, but it can help us get that number a little bit closer to zero. In fact, one of the more common examples of where machine learning might help us are predictive algorithms for energy conservation. For example, a recent paper focused on using reinforcement learning to optimize heating control found that reinforcement learning algorithms minimized energy consumption while keeping people more comfortable than traditional optimization methods. Another paper focused on developing a machine learning model that could track the emissions of every fossil fuel burning power plant on Earth. And in the interest of supporting research on microgrids, self-contained electrical grids that can disconnect from the main grid while reliably still supplying energy to local communities, researchers developed a machine learning system that models hundreds of different microgrid configurations so that more work can focus on developing algorithms that efficiently control microgrid energy supply. Machine learning research has also focused on climate modeling so that we can better understand the impact that climate trends have on anything from sea levels to local agriculture. In fact, one of the challenges of climate modeling is that climate models are known to be subject to a certain amount of error, typically stemming from a lack of observational data as well as errors in the modeling of certain climate-related phenomena. Climate researchers can reduce these errors using a technique called Model Output Statistics, or MLS, which uses machine learning to fine-tune existing climate models based on the observational data that researchers have access to. Now, normally the machine learning models used to do this kind of fine-tuning are fairly simple, things like regression models or random forest models. However, a recent paper took the new approach of applying convolutional neural networks to the same task and was able to reduce climate model errors even further. Interestingly, there's also been some work on using machine learning to combat climate misinformation online. As you're all probably aware, because you've been on the internet for more than five minutes, just because it's on the internet doesn't make it true. In fact, there's a decent chance that it's either partially true or not true at all, and it can be hard to know whether the information that you happen to be looking at at the moment is accurate if you're not particularly well versed in the subject. Because of this, there's been increasing interest in using machine learning, specifically natural language processing, to identify misinformation in real time for users. In fact, while using machine learning to identify climate-related misinformation is an ongoing challenge, researchers have begun to create public data sets of collected and labeled climate-related claims from the internet to help advance work in this field. 
In the meantime, however, we can use machine learning to analyze social media posts from people experiencing extreme weather events to better understand the types of support they need. This paper from last year focuses on that task, although there are many other examples of researchers using sentiment analysis to understand disasters in real time. But speaking of things that aren't necessarily true, let's talk about the environmental impacts of machine learning research. A figure that you may have heard when it comes to carbon emissions and machine learning is that the process of training a model once has roughly the same carbon footprint as five American cars over their lifetime, including the car manufacturing process. This figure is taken from a paper called Energy and Policy Considerations for Deep Learning and Natural Language Processing, which was heavily covered by the media when it was originally published in 2019. However, this figure is taken somewhat out of context. In fact, the vast majority of researchers aren't developing machine learning models that come anywhere close to that level of emissions, which the paper notes. Training a common NLP model generates 1 50th of the emissions of a flight from New York to San Francisco, or the equivalent of running your air conditioner for about eight hours. The models that do generate these massive carbon footprints are more like GPT-3, transformer models that are developed using neural architecture search, a technique that optimizes the design of a model by creating and testing upwards of thousands of different model layouts. Add in the large data sets that these models are typically trained on, and you can see how these massive models might present an issue for climate. But most researchers aren't developing models like GPT-3 using methods like neural architecture search. So what about the rest of the field? Well, it's certainly true that the computational resources used to train machine learning models and needed to train some of those large models increases by orders of magnitude every year. This is one of the factors that has driven a recent interest in alternative computer architecture so that we can train models more efficiently, because even if you're not taking climate into consideration, we're hitting a point where large models are difficult to train with our limited computational resources. But, and this is a really important distinction, the amount of compute that we need to train these models doesn't scale directly with the amount of energy that we need to perform the computation. In fact, a science article from 2020 notes that as we've developed more efficient data centers, the amount of energy required to perform a computation has actually decreased significantly by a factor of four since 2010. And if we're looking at things from a global perspective, we've seen a six-fold increase in global compute instances with a 25% increase in the associated global server energy usage and a 25-fold increase in data storage capacity with a three-fold increase in global data storage energy use. In short, while we're definitely using more computational resources year over year to train these larger models, the actual energy increase associated with that is a fraction of the increase in compute that we're using. But an increase is an increase, and as we talked about earlier, training models does require electricity, which produces some level of carbon emissions depending on the source of that energy. And while there are companies such as Google which have pledged and achieved carbon neutrality by buying renewable energy sources, as well as who have pledged to become carbon free in the coming decades, in the interim, it would be nice to have ways of developing models that are generally more more energy efficient. And there's been a lot of interesting research in this area, often termed green AI, both on the model development side as well as on the hardware side. This includes recent work using that same neural architecture search method that we discussed earlier to develop customized deep learning models that are tailored to run more efficiently on specific hardware. Another recent paper found that deep neural networks contain tiny sub-networks that can be trained to the same accuracy as that larger network, but at one-tenth of the size. On the hardware side, there's a lot of interest in things like neuromorphic chips, which we've discussed in past videos, because after all, if our brains are so energy efficient, perhaps our hardware can learn something from it. And remember those microgrids that we talked about earlier in the video? Researchers are also working to design chips under that same strategy that can adapt to the energy and processing requirements of each model being trained. And the last example I'll give actually came out about a week before this video goes live. Researchers at the University of Cambridge released a preprint on the environmental impacts of federated learning, a training method that relies on decentralized data sources to maintain user privacy. Interestingly, their results showed that training a model using federated learning generates way fewer carbon emissions than training the same model Model on one system, up to a 75% decrease depending on the model being trained. Now, these results are preliminary, but if it does turn out that federated learning is a cleaner way of training machine learning models, it could be interesting to see where that kind of work goes, especially since federated learning incorporates data privacy as well. In short, machine learning probably isn't going to save us from climate change by itself, but it's also not going to doom us to a climate disaster at the same time. And ongoing research in machine learning definitely has the potential to help us reduce that 51 billion number down to zero, while also helping us develop more powerful computing systems, improve data privacy, and educate people on misinformation. Sounds like a win to me.
If you're interested in learning more about the technologies and innovations needed to reverse the trends of global warming, as well as hearing about Bill Gates's wide-ranging practical and accessible plan for how the world can get to zero greenhouse gas emissions in time to avoid a climate catastrophe, order How to Avoid a Climate Disaster using the link in the description. With the help of experts in the fields of physics, chemistry, biology, engineering, political science, and finance, Gates focuses on what must be done to stop the planet's slide towards certain environmental disaster, explaining not only why we need to work towards net zero emissions of greenhouse gases, but also what we need to do to achieve this profoundly important goal.